Good morning, Boulder Creek Community Church. It's so fun to be back. Some of you remember. Thank you. Some of you remember me from a couple of years ago. I was privileged to come a number of times before Adam got here to be with you. And so it really is like being back with family. I say this whenever I get to speak around town, that we're just one big church meeting in different locations on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night whenever services are happening. So I'm excited to be with this section of the family this morning, and thanks so much for having me. I forgot a picture of my family this morning, but I promise I will not forget next week. I'm here with you for two weeks, so I will bring one next week. Somebody asked how old our kids are now. Our oldest is now 13. Our youngest is almost nine. They were little last time I was here, so I will bring a picture so you can see what they look like now. Well, as we begin today, let me read for you the scripture that we're going to be studying. If you have a Bible, you can meet me in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, and this is what it says. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, terribly tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority when soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who were following, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. What a story, right? Well, in these two weeks together, I want to look at two different passages out of Matthew. The first that I just read reveals to us Jesus' amazing power. And next week when I come back, we will read a second that reveals Jesus' true identity. And this morning in Matthew 8, we need to know that this passage comes on the heels of Jesus delivering the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And so as we enter into chapter 8, we see Jesus revealing now the fact that his authority isn't just based on his amazing words, his amazing teaching. Instead, in chapter 8, we begin to see that his mighty words are backed up with mighty deeds. In other words, we see his power unleashed as with great compassion, Jesus begins to demonstrate his authority over sickness, his authority over the world of nature, his authority over the world of the supernatural, and even authority over life and death. And these demonstrations of power in Matthew 8, these miracles are really signposts pointing the way towards the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, ultimately, these miracles reveal Jesus' identity not just as a good moral teacher or as a good guy, but as God, the divine Savior who has power over everything. What's more, these miracles point to the fact that Jesus wants a relationship with us. Time and time again in these accounts of healing we read in the Gospels, they involve Jesus inviting or allowing people to draw near to him, to come to him. In other words, Jesus gets physically close to others so they can receive healing or ask for healing. Or in some cases, Jesus is the one who takes the initiative to get close to others, to physically touch them. Now, I want to be clear, Jesus does not have to get close to heal. As we're going to see in today's story, he is powerful enough to heal at a distance, but rather I believe the larger truth underlying this desire for Jesus to be healed close to us is that he wants to be in relationship with us. He desires relationship with us. Third, these miracle accounts in Matthew are a foretaste of what's to come. 
You know, Scripture tells us in the book of Revelation, kind of the spoiler book at the end of the Bible, how it's all going to wrap up, that there will be a time when God will make a new heaven and a new earth, an earth no longer bound by sin and brokenness and death. In fact, the Apostle John, who wrote Revelation, put it this way in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Church, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that is a picture of your secure and certain future. God will make everything new. And these miracles we read about in the Gospels are a foretaste of what's to come, just a little hint of the healing and restoration that's to come. So if you're in need of hope this morning, you've come to the right place. And so let's get back to Matthew at chapter 8. But first, let me give you a little story from my own life. Some of you may know this. I think I've mentioned it before when I've taught here in the past, but I actually am not a true Californian. I grew up in the state of Michigan. Oh, another another Michigander. Okay, a couple of you. You're willing to raise your hands. Fantastic. Sometimes people won't admit it, but yes, good job. Thank you. No, Michigan is a gorgeous state. It is stunning. There are rolling hills and trees and grass and the Great Lakes, but there's also a lot of gray and cold days, a lot of snow, yes. In fact, in January of this year, this is an awful stat. If you know anybody in Michigan now, please don't don't repeat this for them. But in January of this year, in the first eight days of 2023, it was reported that Grand Rapids, Michigan, only saw five minutes of sun. Five minutes of sun in the first eight days of 2023. Uh, I know, grown, right? Sorry, Michigander friends. And this is due in part to something called the lake effect. And if you have grown up in Michigan or you, the Midwest, you probably know what the lake effect is. The lake effect is this. There's this cold air from Canada that comes across Canada and then swoops down over the Great Lakes. And as that cold air moves over the relatively warm water of the Great Lakes, Moisture gets sucked up into the clouds. Then those moisture-heavy clouds move over the state of Michigan and begin to dump snow. And I do mean dump snow, like two to three inches every hour. It is absolutely insane when it happens. Now, as somebody who grew up there, I can attest that what you kind of have to do is figure out how to deal with this lake effect early on, because it's just a reality. It's not going to change. And that means, especially as a kid, You quickly learn to pick up sports like ice hockey or ice skating. Here's me, ice skating, about eight years old. But before you can head out onto the nearest frozen lake to play, there's something that every child in Michigan is taught how to do. You're taught how to test the thickness of the ice. And just in case you ever find yourself in Michigan on a lake needing to to test the thickness of the ice, I'm going to teach you all something here this morning. Hold up four fingers. Four to, yeah, four fingers, great. This is the number of inches thick that the ice needs to be to support your weight. Four inches. Every kid there knows this. So even a young child will learn to take out their little ice drill and drill down and then stick their little four-inch stick in to make sure that the ice truly is four inches thick before they will head out to play. In other words, you quickly learn whether or not that ice is worth placing your faith in before you head out there to do whatever it is you're going to do. Now, in today's passage, we are going to meet a man, a centurion, who had great power and authority, and he makes a bold decision. The decision to step out, to trust the ice, so to speak, by approaching Jesus, and to dare to believe that Jesus did indeed have the power to help him in his time of need. 
And so let's begin this morning to learn a little bit about the centurion. Now, who was he? Well, a centurion by occupation was a Roman officer, part of the Roman army. And to give you a feel for the scope of influence of a centurion, in one Roman legion, there were roughly 4,000 to 6,000 soldiers. Then each legion was divided into 60 centuries. So in each century, there were somewhere between 70 and 100 men or soldiers, and in command of each century was, you guessed it, a centurion. So these centurions were responsible for the discipline and leadership of a large number of soldiers. What's more, these Roman centurions actually had a good reputation. They were known as steady, reliable, and commanding leaders. They had to be for these gentlemen to follow them. And for the purposes of this story, we need to understand that these centurions were also Gentiles. They were Roman citizens. They were not Jews. Now, this is why we need to understand that little point this morning, because here we have the centurion, a Gentile, approaching Jesus, a Jew, for help. And you see, that just didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen is that at that day and in that age, Gentiles did so, or saw the Jews as people who did so many things to keep themselves set, as, set aside, set apart, and pure. And the Jews looked at the Gentiles and saw them doing none of those ritualistic things and thought, they are just not doing what's right. They are impure, they're unclean. And so those two groups stayed apart. In fact, practically, among other things, Gentiles and Jews could not enter the temple together. Gentiles weren't allowed in the temple at all. It was just for Jews. A Gentile and Jew were not allowed to marry one another. You get the idea. They just didn't go together. However, there was something special about this centurion, this Gentile, that led him to approach Jesus that day, to despite, despite whatever cultural barriers may have been in play. And I think that something special was this, his attitude toward his servant, the centurion's attitude toward his servant. You see, this servant would have actually been the centurion's slave. And what's interesting is the Greek word used here for servant indicates that this particular servant would have been a younger boy, maybe even only a child. This was not an adult servant. What's more, in the Roman Empire, servants were viewed as nothing more than property. And as property, in general, slave masters didn't care whether their slave or their servant suffered, whether they lived or died. In fact, it's interesting, Aristotle, speaking of the relationship between master and servant at this time, wrote this. He said, there can be no friendship nor justice towards inanimate things, for master and slave have nothing in common. In other words, a slave was no better than a lifeless object to most Roman masters. But this centurion, this master, viewed his slave boy differently. And in verses 5 and 6, we're told that he seeks Jesus out, breaks through whatever barriers might have existed on behalf of this young boy. Why? Because he cared. In fact, I love how the NASB renders verses 5 and 6. It says, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him. The NLT translates that as when Jesus entered to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with Jesus. Now, begging and pleading, those were not normal behaviors for strong, commanding leaders. But rather, this intense emotion tells us that these are not the cries of a master who views his servant as worthless property. No, these are the cries of a man desperate to find help for a boy he truly cares about. And this centurion is going out on a limb here. You see, he may have heard about the leper's healing, which comes right before the story in Matthew, although the Gospels don't tell us that, so we don't know. We actually have no indication the centurion has even ever met Jesus. And so even though he has not had an opportunity to personally test the ice, to see if Jesus truly is who he says he is, he decides to step 
forward anyway and to exercise faith. And look at Jesus' response in verse 7. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And this brings us to the very first thing that this encounter between the centurion and Jesus reveals, and it's this. Faith alone is our passport to Jesus. Faith alone is your and my passport to Jesus. My husband and I took our boys to Mexico a few years ago for vacation, and it was the first time that either of our boys had traveled to a foreign country, and so we had to get each of them a passport to be able to take them. And these passports were a big deal to our kids. In fact, my youngest, Luke, remember, he stepped up to the customs desk and flashed his passport and got his stamp and heard the gentleman say, Bienvenido a Mexico. And then we stepped away from the desk, and Luke looked up at me, and he was like, that's it? <laughs> like, I just show it to him, and he stamps it, and we walk through, like, all this for that? Like, that doesn't seem that important. Church, might I suggest this morning that sometimes we overcomplicate the process of coming to Jesus? We overcomplicate the process of coming to Jesus. Instead of seeing faith as the only thing we need to step towards him, we layer a list of demands on ourselves or on others. We set up impossible standards of behavior, thinking that we need to get our acts together first, before we can approach Jesus. I love what Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16 tell us. Hebrews says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may have mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Don't miss verse 14. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. In other words, to get to God where we find grace and mercy to help us, only one thing is needed, faith in Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the high priest. He's the one who has done all the sacrificial cleanup work for us. That means, church, you can tear up your spiritual score sheet where you've been keeping track of how good or not good you are, how well you've been doing in your quiet times or not. I'm all for quiet times, but that's not what gives you access to Jesus. Faith alone does. It's not about our behavior. It's only about faith. But maybe you're here today and you're thinking, well, that sounds nice, Sarah, but what exactly does faith look like? Well, here's how Hebrews 11 verse 1 defines faith. And I love this verse rendered in the Living Bible. It says this, what is faith? It's the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It's the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we can't see it up ahead. In other words, faith looks like you and me having confidence that God will fulfill his promises, even if we have yet to see it happen, to believe that it will happen. But there's one more aspect to faith that we have to be crystal clear on, and it's this. The object of our faith matters. The object of your faith and my faith matters. You know, when I'm not teaching, a majority of my ministry over the last 20 plus years has been providing pastoral cares, pair to care to people who find themselves in really hard situations. Maybe in the hospital with an illness or um, a physical problem or perhaps after the death of a loved one. And I've heard people time and time again fall into this trap of putting their faith in their doctor or in their own strength to kind of muscle their way through whatever tricky situation they find themselves in, only to be let down time and time again. Because as wonderful as doctors are and as wonderful as you may be, none of us have what it takes to be Jesus. We're not Jesus. 
the object of your faith matters. I love what Tim Keller says to this point. He writes, it is not the, th the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves and helps you. The object of our faith, church, is Jesus. And so let's come back to this first thing we learn out of this encounter. Faith alone is our passport to Jesus. And this brings us to the second thing we learn from this story, and it's this. Authentic faith always includes a response. Authentic faith always includes a response. Meet me back in Matthew 8, verse 8. Let's look at the centurion's response to Jesus' offer to come and heal his servant. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Let me pause here for just a moment to say that there are two things worth pointing out about the centurion's response here. The first is this, his radical humility. In other words, the way that he responds shows that he actually understands, he has a correct view of himself in relation to God. He knows that in and of himself, he's not worthy, not worthy to have Jesus come to his home. And the second thing worth noting of his response is this, his radical trust. Keep in mind, he hardly knows Jesus and yet he displays total, complete, radical trust in Jesus' authority and Jesus' power when he says, just say the word, and I believe my servant will be healed. Radical humility, radical trust. And the next few verses give us a clue as to why the centurion responds in this way. Here's what the centurion says beginning in verse 9. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. You see, this centurion and Jesus actually have something in common, and it's this, their understanding of authority. Here's what I mean. As a Roman officer, this centurion knew that he could say to any of his soldiers, go do X, and that soldier would automatically go do X. Now, why was this? Well, that was because every centurion knew they had the power of the entire Roman Empire backing them. And if you remember anything about the Roman Empire from your history classes, they were not a force to mess with. They were strong. Likewise, the centurion seems to understand that Jesus also has authority. But unlike the centurion's authority, Jesus' authority is not based on the strength of a nation or any particular ruler. Rather, Jesus' authority comes from his being one with God. The fact that he and the Father are one. In fact, Jesus would say this to his disciples later in the book of Matthew. In Matthew 28, 18, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. You see, the centurion chooses to come to Jesus in faith, to place his confidence there, believing that there is a much greater power at Jesus' disposal than he can see. And do you know what? He's right. He's right. And so he says to Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. And even by Jesus' own admonition, the response of the centurion here is nothing short of unbelievable. Check out verse 10 again. When Jesus heard this, he was, what? Amazed. Do you know that there are only two times in all of the Gospels where we're told that Jesus is amazed at something? This is one of them. The other happens in Mark 6.6. 6 where Jesus is amazed at Israel's unbelief. So here Jesus is amazed at the belief of the centurion. The only other time is Jesus being amazed at the unbelief of Israel. And all of this causes me to ask myself the question, is I consider the circumstances in my life right now, how am I responding to Jesus right now? As you consider the circumstances in your life right now, how are you responding to Jesus right now? 
with great belief or with unbelief? And this isn't a performance question. It's, am I doing a good job believing? Ultimately, it's a trust question. Are we willing to respond with radical trust and radical humility to Jesus? I know in a room this size that there are some heavy needs represented here today. Perhaps needs that even the people around you know nothing about. You're in a situation maybe where you feel helpless or hopeless. And if that's you, can I encourage you to remember this morning that Jesus is with you. And Jesus is for you. And all he asks is that you respond in faith and bring your needs to him. Faith alone is our passport to Jesus. And authentic faith always includes a response to Jesus. Here, that response looks like moving towards Jesus with humility and trust. And finally, this encounter between Jesus and the centurion reminds us that suffering has an expiration date. Suffering has an expiration date. Remember how just a moment ago, Jesus was amazed at the centurion's faith? Well, let's pick the story back up in verse 10. Now, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who were following, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west, will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go. It shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. You see, here's the thing. We can't forget that this interaction between Jesus and the centurion, while personal, was definitely not private. In fact, Matthew tells us at the beginning of this chapter that large crowds are already following Jesus at this point. There are a ton of people around as this interaction is going down, and that crowd would have been filled with both Jews and Gentiles. So while it's safe to assume that Jesus gets to this part of this conversation with the centurion, some of the mouths of those Jewish hearers would have been dropping wide open, and here's why. Because in verse 11, Jesus uses a well-known and vivid picture, one that we might not understand unless you're Jewish or have a Jewish background, but one that would have been very familiar to the Jews standing there. And it's a picture of what's called the Messianic banquet. And here's what that meant. You see, for Jews, they believed that when the Messiah came, there would be this great banquet where all the Jews would sit down with the Messiah at this grand table to feast and eat and enjoy time together. For a Jew, this was the ultimate picture of completion, of wholeness. It brought, ho- it brought excitement, it brought hope, it brought peace. The Jews standing around Jesus that day would have been looking forward to that banquet with their whole hearts, but never for a moment would they have guessed that any Gentile would be sitting at that table with them. And yet here is Jesus saying, people will come from the east and the west, meaning Jews and Gentiles, and they will recline at that table together. And then Jesus' statement gets even more disconcerting for the Jewish listeners because in verse 12, he makes it clear that there will be some sons of the kingdom, which is another word for the children of Israel, who will simply assume that they're invited to the banquet based on their heritage or their personal merit, but who will actually be thrown out because they failed to understand that it's not about their personal merit or their heritage, but about faith alone, putting their trust in the Messiah. And I want to be clear, Jesus is not indicting the Jews in general. Remember, Jesus himself was Jewish but rather he's specifically speaking to those overly pious pious Jews in the crowd who were stuck on relying on their own merit, not faith, to give them access to the kingdom. So here Jesus is defining in bold terms what the kingdom of God will look like, and he defines it as a place, as we read in Revelation 7 earlier, 
where people from every tongue and tribe and nation will come together praising God. In short, Jesus is saying it's not about what nation you come from or what your pedigree is. It's simply about whether or not you've placed your trust, your faith in me. And then Jesus focuses his conversation back in the direction of the centurion. And he says to him, go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Now, I do want to address something. Anytime we read in scripture about healing, I realize that for many of us, it brings up some hard emotions. Because maybe you're somebody who has prayed for years for healing and it hasn't come. Or maybe you've prayed for years for healing for somebody else and it hasn't come. And so let me say this, there is no promise anywhere in scripture that we will be healed in this life. That's not a promise we get. The promise we do get is that Jesus says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, that he's with us in every circumstance. And he's honest with us that in this world we will have trouble. In fact, John 16, says just that. It's not a matter of if you're gonna have trouble. For really, for all of us, it's just a matter of when it's gonna come and what it's gonna look like. And I can speak personally about this. My life is living proof of this. I mentioned this in a previous sermon, but in 2005, I had a stroke, a brain bleed. Took me out of commission for almost a year and a half. Doctors were not sure I was gonna recover. I also have a seizure disorder completely unrelated to that stroke. I can say with assurance this morning, I have not yet been healed. In fact, I take a handful of medications every morning and every night to help my brain stay on track. Thank God that there's medication that can do that. But while I have not yet been healed, Thank God that today is not the end of the story. And for you, today is not the end of the story. There is a life beyond this life. And for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, this life that is to come reminds us that suffering does have an expiration date. Let's think back to that verse in John, John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You see, our hope doesn't, doesn't lie in the absence of trouble. Our hope lies in the fact that we have the presence and power of a loving Savior who has already won the fight. What's more, we're promised in verses like Revelation 21, 4 through 5, that at some point in this life to come, every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Church, suffering has an expiration date. Yeah, big amen, that's huge. What you are walking through right now will not last forever. And I hope this morning that that brings unquenchable hope. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And these points are going to pop back up on the screen. That faith alone is our passport to Jesus. That authentic faith always includes a response. And that suffering has an expiration date. And maybe you want to write those down or maybe you want to pull out your phone and take a picture of those because here's the thing, I guarantee at some point in this next week or in the next couple of weeks, you're going to need to remember these points because life is hard. Because life is hard. And so I hope that these encourage you this morning. Let's bow our our eyes, our heads, our minds, our hearts in prayer as we continue. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that this life is not all there is. We thank you that suffering has an expiration date. And we thank you that all you ask of us is for us to put our faith in you so that we can experience the fullness of your presence 
and your love. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would empower us to respond in faith, to draw near to you, to lay our burdens and our troubles at your feet and to allow you to be the one to manage those for us. Jesus, we thank you for your love. Help us to live out of that love today. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen. As we continue in worship, we're going to have the privilege of taking communion together this morning. And we do this to be reminded of the great love that God has for us. Scripture tells us that God sent his son, Jesus, to this earth to take on human flesh, to walk through the same struggles that you and I walk through, and yet Jesus did all that without sin. And then he willingly went to the cross, not because he had to, not because anybody forced him to be up there, but he allowed himself to be there so he could bear the full burden of our sin debt. But the good news is Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, Scripture tells us he rose back to life, proving once and for all that suffering does have an expiration date, that sin and death ultimately have been defeated. And now those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus have that hope. We have the hope of his presence now with us through his Holy Spirit, and we have the hope of eternal life with him when this life on this earth is over. And so in just a moment, you're going to have the opportunity to come forward and to pick up the elements and take them back to your seat and to remember what it means that Jesus chose to go to the cross for you. And in those few moments before you take those elements, I want to encourage you to do some business, as I call it, with Jesus. Allow him to do an inventory of your heart. Ask him, Lord, is there anything that I'm holding on to that I really need to hand over to you? Any ways that maybe I'm not trusting you? I'm not following you completely. And would you help me in those areas? Would you forgive me where I need forgiveness? And then once you've done that, when you are ready, you can take that bread and that juice and eat them on your own timing, remembering that they represent Jesus' body broken for us and Jesus' blood shed for us. So whenever you're ready, come on forward and let's remember Jesus together.